So uh, the, today is going to be about how investors evaluate startups. Uh, so we, before we go into depth on this topic, uh, well, of course, thanks for being here. Uh, can I ask you, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, I'm uh, Jacqueline. Um, I'm a, currently a partner at Big Capital. Uh, Big Capital is a 66 million euro venture capital fund, an early stage seed fund. So we invest in SaaS and marketplace funds, uh, or SaaS and marketplace startups across Europe, but primarily in the Benelux in Germany and the Nordics. Um, and personally, I'm a bit of a mixed bag of experiences. I've had uh, a lot of experience as an, as an entrepreneur myself. I've built several companies uh, and I've also worked in several investment roles. So I'm a bit of a hybrid entrepreneur investor. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. So what do you look for in a startup from your personal role, but also from uh, your peak position? Um, well, we... Always in peak, actually, we look at uh, and some we use what we call the T score, and the T score consists of team, traction, thesis, and timing. And so, in early stage, in the earlier stage you are as an investor, the more it is about the team. Yeah, so how yeah. do you value a great team? What are triggers for a great team? Yeah, triggers for a great team, I think, well, one thing that absolutely helps and is a big plus is that you have some prior entrepreneurial experience. And for me, even if you were, you know, selling lemonade at the age of 14 or 15, that, also, that already means that there are some sort of hustling entrepreneurial commercial skills. How so. do you show that? I mean, you don't yeah. put a lemonade stand in your pitch deck. Um, no, but you can see it in a bit of a, a path. Has somebody been entrepreneurial at an early age? Has somebody uh, tried things? The reason why that's so important is because inevitably, when you start your first company, and it goes for me exactly the same, you make a ton of mistakes. And so doing it again, you get to avoid the mistakes you made in the first run. And so you know much better what to expect. And statistically, yeah. the chances of succeeding on the second or third run are much higher than on the first run. So, so I think that's one aspect. The second aspect that we look for in teams is complementarity. So we look for, and I think this is typical uh, a startup slang, the hacker, the hustler, and the hipster. Um, and so we always want a hacker, a CTO type person to be in the team because we invest in tech startups, it needs to be yeah. inherently tech. But we also need a very strong but commercial What about outsourcing right? and those kind of constructions, at least at yeah. first? Yeah, you know, not question. all startups can find a CTO yeah. from day one. I think that's okay. It depends a bit what kind of business you have, right? If you are a deep tech business, outsourcing is not an option. If you're more of an e-commerce play and, and tech is less central, you can do make do with, I don't know, freelance developers in Hungary. Yeah. Um, as long as ultimately the tech leadership, so the CTO, the architecture is within your founding team mm -hmm. and has a significant stake. So what we also don't necessarily like is hired CTOs, people are on the payroll, but don't have a strong equity stake. Yeah. All right, cool. So that's team. What about the other three teams? Yeah, so, so, um, so thesis, uh, what we look for in the thesis, the thesis is what do you do? And what is the problem that you solve? And how do you solve it? How much value do you add uh, to your customer? Can you give a great example? Um, well, an example would be uh, something such as Slack, right? Slack is uh, a hugely valuable company because you use it every single day and it's at the core of your business. Um, now, you can compare that to something that is more of a feature, right? Uh, say, well, a chat bot can either be core to the business, but it can also just be a nice to have feature on top of your business. So the question is how central, how much value um, do you create? And there's a great test for that on product market fit. It's called the Sean Ellis test. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. So the Sean Ellis test uh, asks your customers, uh, what would your life look like or how would you feel if we stopped to exist, if we ceased to exist? And so if, if that is you know, a major problem to your customer, you know you're creating a ton of value and it's not a nice to have, but a need to have. Usually, you there. should have over forty percent to have product market fit, right? That's absolutely right. Yes, correct. So, yeah. so we look at the value of the solution. We look at the market size, um, 
it's, a, it's pretty standard. And the third thing that we obviously look at is uh, how competitive is the space. Yeah. Again, for example, in the field of, of chatbots, you see that it's getting wildly competitive. Um, and, and, and or, or, or do you address a very particular niche, right, in which mm -hmm. you can create a certain value? Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, you, the last three was timing. So, how do you influence timing? Well, do you actually? And timing? Yeah. yeah. Um, timing to us uh, is uh, a bit of a question of all the previous, all of the above, uh, but timing is also how much money have you raised to date. If you've raised, say, a million to million and you're now at 20k MRR, mm, that raises some questions. Uh, how much Just for the yeah. really beginner's MRR being... Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Monthly recurring revenue, which right. is uh, one of the... Uh, key KPIs for any SaaS type business and recurring revenue is the holy grail of, yeah. of uh, SaaS businesses. Um, but we also look at, for example, founder equity. So has somebody diluted quite a lot? So if you raise too much money in an early stage, then what happens is that founders dilute to cert below a certain threshold. And when founders have, for example, less than 50% uh, equity at the phase of a seed round, that's problematic because they're gonna dilute much further down. Mm -hmm. And then the question for an investor, because an investor always has a risk perspective, is how motivated is somebody to, to stay? Because when it, it gets rough, and it will get rough, mm -hmm. right? When the sailing yeah. gets rough, then people might at a certain point say, well, you know, I don't have enough skin in the game. I'm gonna move on to my next big idea. And yeah. then the investor, you leave the investor hanging. And yeah, so, th so those are a couple of factors that yeah. we consider. Yeah. All right. Um, so you said you're quite an early stage investment fund, uh, but at the same time, do you invest? Are you usually the first investor in a company or a follow-up investor? Yeah, so we are normally the the seed investor, and often the companies that we invest in are either bootstrapped or they have angel funding. But normally, we're the first institutional or investor that that comes on board. Yeah. Yeah. So. Either uh, when they're looking for amounts that you provide, or you know, lower like angel investors, for example. Mm. When do you think startups should look for funding? Uh, when you need money, uh, that's a good point to start thinking about it. Um, but it depends what kind of phase and what kind of type of investor. So, so when you're just off the ground, you have an idea, you have, you're looking for product market fit. You have no or very little commercial traction. At that point, you probably want to consider an angel. And in that phase, the value add is not just money. It's very much, you should really look for an angel investor who you know, is active in your space, has a network in that space, uh, who can really be an active collaborator. Yeah. That's important. Um, then I think you, you look towards a VC, and a VC like the Capital Seed Stage VC can come when you have some sort of early proof of product market fit. And what gives you proof of product market fit? It means that you're starting to have some commercial traction. Yeah. So we invest either in ex very experienced entrepreneurs with a proven track record, which can be pre-revenue, mm -hmm. or uh, at the moment that you start to get a little bit of traction, and that can be very steep growth in a three-month time frame. Or, or decent growth in a 12 month time frame. So, yeah. yeah. Um, after that moment, uh, I remember from an interview with one of your partners, Johan, saying yeah. whenever we invest, it's pedal to the metal. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the venture capital model is, is that you make a 10x return yeah. on any investment that you do. Why? Because uh, part of your investments will you know, will, will likely go bankrupt. That actually never happened with P Capital, but I mean, that is typically the VC model. Mm -hmm. A couple will make it uh, to a medium sized business. And so the VC model relies on you also investing in, 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 a, in a type of unicorn. Yeah. Um, so, yes, it's pedal to the metal. Uh, and we look for companies that want, that have that ambition to really do something very big. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, you have quite a track record and you already mentioned, you know, before people start working with you, they might work with angels, those kind of people, the smart money, people that actually participate in your company. Yeah. How do you find the right investor for your company? Um, 
I think it's very wise to do some desk research and also ask people in your environment. I think what is important when you look for an investor is an investor that is active in your space. So you should know very well uh, what is the phase in which a VC invests. Is that early stage? Is that, you know, do they have a minimum revenue threshold, say 100k MRR or, or lower? That's one. Do they invest in your type of business? And you have mostly investors will define whether they're B2B or B2C. Uh, is there any particular business model requirement? And I generally recommend to really start from your own network. You know, Why is that? Well, because a warm intro is so much more powerful than a cold intro. It's very difficult. You know, we receive many pitch decks, and yes, we look at them. How many? Um, on average, 10 to 15 a week. Uh, that's just cold emails. So that's about 500 to 700 per year. Oh, more. And how many more. investments do you do per year? We do, um, our target this year would be to do approximately six investments. Okay, so that's less than 1%. Yeah, yeah, the funnel is, right. is really small. Is a warm introduction also the best way to get to you or one of your partners? Um, yes, though you know people are absolutely free to message me on LinkedIn and I will always try to reply in person uh, and, and to take it seriously. Um, but if you can find a warm intro, so it's somebody in your network, a friend, an extra entrepreneur who can give you a warm intro that makes it quite, you know, it just puts you at, at as an advantage right off the bat. Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, you mentioned the four T's already. Uh, so let's say the first time that you see a pitch deck or the first time that you meet a founder, like what's the, what are the key triggers, a positive side, but also the red flag, so the negative side. So what makes you think like, hey, I want to know more, or what makes you think like, oh, this is definitely not going to work out? Yeah, um, that's a, a good question, a hard one. Um, because you know when you when you evaluate a proposition, it's often a sort of a combination of factors. When I was thinking about it, I thought you know what are sort of like the triggers that I think well ooh, this is very interesting. I think on the on the personal level, it is confidence, a big ambition, right? And 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 people there are a lot of people who want to build a mid-sized business. There are a few people who have really a big vision. Um, so big vision is is great. Again, that experience that you know somebody really you know has a drive, and they don't need me. They don't need our money. They're gonna make it on their own any which way, right? That is, that that I think is very strong. Yeah. So on instead a of level, yeah. instead of what we always say is instead of uh, having people or needing people to become interesting, yeah. first you become interesting, and then with those people you become become even more or even better yes. together with some someone like like peak exactly and i think it's good to have an eye level conversation not like yeah. oh gosh i really hope i pray that you will invest in my my startup uh, you, but you get a lot of those people who put you on a certain pedestal for example well there's definitely a difference in in the level of experience that you have um but I would say, you know, I would encourage startups to not be afraid and, you know, you have a great idea, this is your plan, you, you're going to make it on your own, you should not have any kind of dependencies on, on VCs, and if VCs want to join you in that ride, that's great. Um, so, I think that's on, on the team level. On, on the thesis level, for me, I'd like to know what's different, you know, and, and um, there are a lot of people pursuing the same idea. That's, mm -hmm. you know, any idea, there are at least 20 other people working on the same idea. How, well, yeah. how much should the difference be? Because uh, you'll also see that if you do something that's completely different, yeah. then it's very hard for people to adopt. Yeah, well that's a good question. Um, I think you need to have some sort of, uh, you need to have a clear story on why your solution is better than what exists, but there can also be a difference in how you execute, right? So. So, so an idea is a starting point, but execution is ultimately whether you are or are not successful. So we look, so we look yeah. at both, yeah. All right, yeah. Um, so whenever you think, okay, this is becoming interesting, either through an introduction or a first meeting or a pitch deck or any kind of trigger, what's next? What's the process from that moment on? Do you reach out or do they do a follow-up or what usually happens yeah. up to the point that you actually have let's say the final negotiation and you do a term sheet and so forth. Yeah, 
Um, well, it's really a process of several meetings with me and some other partners. So the first thing that we need to establish is do we, you know, do we really connect with the team? And that is a relationship. It's a bit of a dating relationship. You know, you don't know after one date whether you're going to marry your future husband or wife, but it's, it's a bit of building a relationship and, and yeah, at a personal level, I think, and starting to understand the business. So I think you should expect, you know, in such a process, three to four meetings uh, at partner level. Um, and you will have to share everything about your business. You, I mean, your deck and your, your financials, and there will be a lot of, like, there will be a lot of digging by How, how long does that usually take, those three to four meetings? I think in a, in a relatively efficient process, it should take two to three months. All right. Yeah. And after the three to four meetings, or at the end of the three to four meetings? Um, well, so every time you get to the next meeting, that's a good thing, right? So mm -hmm. at VC, will every time evaluate, do we want to continue, yes or no? If you made it to four meetings, there's quite a likelihood of uh, getting a term sheet, and, and that's where you negotiate, uh, do a due diligence, and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, that's where it really starts. Do you usually set the terms, or do, do, you, do the founders usually set the terms? No, we will issue a term sheet and it will have a relatively straightforward terms. I think the terms are not too complicated at the seed stage, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, founders will push back on, on certain terms. They should. They should also, yes. It's also, I mean, never just accept the valuation or the terms as is. Um, Did you ever get a yeah. stop a deal because someone asked too much or would give up too little? Yes, all the time. This is why I was an hour late this morning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got out of a negotiation, a very tough negotiation. Yes. Um, so yeah, and and there are also points where you say I'm going to walk away from this deal. So if this, you know, if we can't get to an certain agreement on the terms and the deal is not a sufficiently good deal, then we then we should walk away. Yeah. Okay. So those are uh, the first steps. So at the end. You send the term sheet. So, what are, let's say, the basic pitfalls that founders go through um, around the stage of receiving a term sheet? What would you advise startups to do if you were on the other side of the table? Yeah, I would say get some advice. You know, uh, go f discuss the term sheet with somebody who has done it before, somebody who's in a little bit of a later stage. Ensure that you understand the the terms. Not all terms are critical, and I think a common mistake is to make a big deal out of things that are not a big deal. You know, you, you need to see the whole VC game as a very long-term play, right? So you're gonna you're gonna go into a 10-year relationship. To, so to get really stuck on the nitty-gritty, it's not a good idea. Focus on the real terms that that are really important. I think those are valuation terms. Those are obviously important. Um, uh, Lock up and lever terms are probably important for 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 a startup. Um, so Can you elaborate a little bit more on those? Lock up and lever rights are basically defined that as a, as a founder you cannot sell your shares uh, before a certain term. Mm -hmm. Vesting terms are always important. Uh, so you might be the founder and hold all of the equity, but a VC will make you agree to terms that if you leave you know before a certain date uh, that's then part of your equity uh, yeah, is, is uh, you don't get part of your shares yeah. um, so that is an important term mm -hmm. yeah those, those are the some of the more important terms yeah, yeah. all right um, so um, you know as you mentioned um, when someone thinks or realizes so I want to work with investors or my com company actually needs investors uh, you know, we briefly discussed, you know, warm introductions, your own network, those kind of things. But, you know, there are also a lot of people who might probably don't have that network or have a lack of a network or a small network. Uh, so what would you advise those people? How do they still find the, the right people for their, for their company? Um, well, there's always LinkedIn. I think if you do your research well, you can find the right VCs uh, and then uh, and then connect with a VC partner on, on LinkedIn. I think that's okay. I get that and, and that's okay with me. Never ever send a cold email. We've also gotten you know mass emails to a whole bunch of investors in the BCC or in the CC. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> this is my great idea. Uh, that's an instant no. Um, 
So I would just, you know, go the LinkedIn route, but yeah. know, be sure that you know that that VC is actually in your space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, what was the best way someone ever reached out to you? Ooh, well, I've only been a VC for six months, so I haven't had very spectacular okay. <laughs> stories uh, in that respect. No, I think just... Uh, All the, right. Yeah. Okay, so for me to wrap up, um, if you would have to give one piece of advice to early stage startup founders looking to partner up with a VC, what would their well biggest, best thing to do be? I think you need to realize that uh, a VC investment is playing the long game. And both in building relationship, even way before you're starting to, to raise funds. So I would, you know, I think it's quite okay that even if you're not ready to raise funds yet, you already connect with VCs and, and maybe you can say, you know, could we have a coffee? I'd love to get your input, some idea. So you already start building that relationship very early on. When is, an, is a VC interested to start building that relationship? Again, it helps if you have a personal relationship okay. or, or if you say, well, I, you know, I know you're very active in that space. Would you like to spend some time with me? Yeah. And is it just and asking that? people for coffee or what is the best way? Because yeah. was like 10 years ago, it was just like, hey, can I buy you lunch? Yeah. But I've noticed that in the last several years, it's more like, hey, can I bring you a coffee? Yeah. Are there certain ways <laughs> <laughs> or is it just, does it vary too much per person? Um, I think a coffee is a good idea. I think a lunch is expensive for startups, so don't spend your money on, on taking investors to lunch. But um, and a coffee is is just fine. Um, don't try to bribe investors. I have had somebody bring me presents, and I did not yet invest in this person, so like, <laughs> not necessarily uh, the, the the best idea. But um, I also mean playing the long game in the sense that you will get rejected. Right, it's inevitable. If you're gonna have a startup and you will pitch it to several VCs, you will receive rejections, and it's important to think about the way that you handle this, because if you s never respond again uh, or respond in a negative way, and we've had that, that some people say, you know, well, I can I can do this without you or something, you yeah. know, some some yeah. some negative words there. Uh, this is uh, then you're not getting it. Because a VC might not want to invest in you now, but they might invest in you yeah. in three months or in six months or in the next round. Yeah. Or they might uh, discuss you with other people in the VC world because yeah. it's a very small world. So, so you really need to play the long game and build very long-term healthy relationships no matter what disappointments you, you, you yeah. meet on, on your journey. All right, cool. So um, you said that you're just uh, been a VC for about six months. That's great. Uh, so you might have some stories from your partners at Peak, um, just for fun, of course. Uh, but have they ever said no to an investment which they completely regretted later on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Can you maybe. say which ones? Or yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. No, I mean it's part of the VC model that you will make. Uh, you will win some, and you will lose some, and yeah. you will also make some wrong. You will just make some wrong judgment calls. Yeah. So that happens. Well, one specific example for us was tickets, which recently raised uh, fifty million from yeah. Airbnb. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. we were in the term sheet phase uh, with that company, and at that moment that we were in the term sheet company in the term sheet phase there were attacks uh, the Paris attacks and yeah. the like business kind of collapsed and there were some things in the communication around that uh, yeah. which then uh, yeah made that we did not invest um, yeah. and I mean tickets has done extremely well and, and yeah. it's definitely one of the companies that we missed out on so yeah. right. but it, it's part of the VC model of course yeah.